Hey, Sally. <laughs> you got the long? The long hallway. You should see the long hallway that I live in. Beautiful. Uh, long and long and thin. I'm used to that. <laughs> you long? I don't know about that, but. <laughs> so let tape. So let tape measure yeah, myself. I, I, don't show him. <laughs> hereditary tell him uh tell him you're live on hot sauce sports tt you're live come here come here say hi to the world this is it this is your chance what's going on buddy all right world what do you mean he knows trying to work trying to stay alive Trying to rethink my life, wondering if I should just drop it all and pursue a, a career as a professional triathlete. <laughs> For real? I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. Quarantine's got me <laughs> fucked up. It's got you thinking crazy stuff, man. But um, what, which, what, what kind of triathlete would you be? Okay, you'd be a, a I think, vegan. A vegan triathlete. I think my distance is going to be the half iron man. Right, okay. I, I did start running. I started taking running very seriously. I got a program that I'm on right now to get me on a sub two hour half marathon. A sub two hour half marathon. You should feel very privileged because I was supposed to run tonight. Oh. But, it, but instead, I am showing you my, my sweet, sweet child. Tell him not to get too. Uh... Tell them not to jump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or else the or else the 113 people are gonna see his, his junk. Oh no, no. don't do it. <laughs> do you hop for TV. I love those you pictures. Me? I love those pictures you sent me with him and the, with the guitar and shit, and he's singing. Uh, the uh, guy's a rock star. He's got a drum set, he's got a yeah. full oh. set of guitars. Stay low there. He's got the hair, he's got it all. You remember? You remember those VHS tapes that, that they used to sell too hot for TV? Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no, Jesus. Hey, hey, better hide that shit, buddy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put something over you. Golly. You can't have my, you see my, my beard there? Look at this guy. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> hey, hey. Get out of here. Get angry. Get angry. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen with uh, the Alouettes? Do you know anything? I've heard that the plan right now, the hopes across the league, is that it'll be a reduced season that'll start after Labor Day. So Labor Day would be the first, you know, set of games that weekend. Um, but as far as you know, if that's going to happen, who knows? You know, the CFL is a, a gate-driven league, and if they can't have fans in the stadium. I don't think there's much incentive to to mobilize everyone to to have a season. Do they make more money on the gate than they do on advertisers? Of course. Yeah, the gate money, especially for the teams out west. Now, there's such a a big discrepancy between the revenues for the teams, you know, who, like Montreal, uh, Toronto, even BC, who's a struggling market. And the teams in the larger, more successful markets like Regina, Edmonton, uh, Winnipeg. And so they kind of balance each other out, but they're, you know, each on one end of the spectrum. So it becomes difficult, you know, even for those teams in, in Regina. I mean, that, that's where all your money's coming and that's where all the revenue sharing amongst the teams in the league is coming from, from, from the gates in those larger markets. And because ad advertising, advertising, how many viewers, viewers do they actually get on TSN, you know, like? They get a fair amount of viewers. Um, they do have a pretty good contract, uh, the league and uh, and TSN. But even that, I don't think that's enough to to keep it afloat and be able to uh, to bankroll the the league's operations for you know for half a season. Because the NFL is 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 looking into pushing the season back a little bit, and the CFL starts before the NFL does. So they're going to have to make a decision now, right? To to see what. Yeah, well, not. Not only that, but there there are several hurdles, even as far as you know, immigration and borders are concerned. I mean, half half your league is is American players uh, that currently can't even come up to the country for for any type of of training camp or anything like that. So uh, they're at the mercy of what the different governments are going to decide, both the Canadian and American governments, and as well as you know, we've seen a big push from Randy Ambrosio over the last couple of uh, months and even years as far as 
uh, CFL 2.0 and getting all those global players involved, uh, you know, from Mexico and other combines in Europe and everything. There's no way those guys are going to be able to travel over here. And that's doubtful if they can even do it once Labor Day rolls around. So I think there's a chance the Americans could be there in time. But as far as those global players, I think that's a whole different can of worms. How many How many is there? There's been, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they're expanding it to two global player roster spots um, this season. It was one last year, but I, I'm, I think they're moving it to two this year. Okay. So, I mean, not that, you know, the global players – have been major contributors, you know, so in, in the first year of their involvement. Yeah. But uh, still, you know, who's, who's one that I would know. Oh gosh. Yeah. I couldn't even tell you one. There was a kicker in Montreal. who was on the practice roster for most of the season. That's because he played soccer uh, or something. Something like that. You know, so anyway, that wouldn't affect it that much. But at that point, I mean, I hope they get it done because the CFL, I mean, the last few years, I mean, it looked up. It was going, it's kind of had an upward trend the last year, I think, they, especially in Montreal anyway. But because uh, I know that their their uh, attendance dropped, uh, it was crazy. But we had a good season last year, so it kind of went back up. And they were on a rebuild. So for the Alouettes, it's kind of like, okay, what are we doing now? We're actually built some momentum here. What are we going to do? Yeah, it's, you know, the, the timing is just awful. I mean, it's awful for everybody, but especially for the Alouettes. Coming off, you know, a season so filled with emotion, the emergence of Vernon Adams Jr., yeah. fans showing up to the games again, new ownership, Danny Machocha in the mix now, you know, just so many things trending in the right direction, and then all of a sudden they hit this brick wall that's completely out of their control. So yeah. if, if there's, you know, if I had to choose a team that's losing most from this situation, definitely the Alouettes. Hey, did you see? Did, did you see uh, on Twitter and, and on the internet, somebody made a mock-up of the Miami Vice, you know the uniforms that the Miami Heat wore? Yeah. Those Miami Vice uniforms? It's the new somebody, Hot, it's the new hot Sauce uh, logo with the same colors. Oh, fantastic. Somebody made the uh, somebody made a, a mock-up of, of the Finns uniform in, in that style and those colors. I'd be into that. But the Finns, I mean, they have the Dolphins. They have a sick like the teal is fucking nice. Like, there's no other team in any sport that has that color, you know. No, it's very unique. I mean, you know, it would help if they were a better football team. I think they caught a break with, you know, <laughs> with Tom Brady moving out of the division. So yeah, I mean, the, that's the thing. I was, that's the thing I was saying about the Dolphins is that in in let's say three years they should be in the Super Bowl, if not a real contender. You know what I mean? If they, if they build the right way over the next couple of seasons, I mean, they're definitely in the mix. And it's, you know, Miami's a great market. Yeah. Uh, you know, South Florida, I mean, I think it, it would be ideal to have a successful team in that market. Uh, yeah. They just, they're missing a couple of pieces and hopefully they can go get them in the draft. And that includes a, a franchise quarterback. I jokingly said that they had like 17 picks in the third round, in the, in the first three rounds. But uh, they have – I don't even know how many picks. They have like seven picks in the first three rounds, which is crazy. I think three of them in the first round. I mean, there's no reason why they shouldn't just kill everybody in the draft this year. And, I mean, I think they had probably the most time to prepare out of everybody because they knew where they were going to be. They knew where they were going to be the entire year. And now that Brady's gone, that new that AFC East is, is – Probably as stacked as it's ever been. Bills made the playoffs last year. They won a game. Um, the Dolphins are obviously with the draft. We'll see what they do. The Jets look like they're a real team now. So, I mean, it's it's tough to not see them in as a contender in the next couple of years. You know, any 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 one of those teams. And but you look at the you look at the Bills. You look at the Jets. Two teams with young franchise quarterback that's yeah. how they're, they're they're building around those guys that's what the dolphins need to go out and get and the dolphins if uh, the thing is with me is i think justin herbert i haven't i didn't watch too much uh, uh college football this year from but from what i did watch to me justin herbert was probably the best one i mean i think he's the, the one that's ready today to play you know and where joe burrows is like the kind of the hot ticket the heisman winner all that shit but at the end of the day is who's going to be able to 
take over right now and do something do something good. I'm I'm a I'm a big hater of Tua. I I don't think Tua is gonna be not a big hater. I'd say obviously he's gonna be good. The guy's fucking sick, but I don't think he's gonna be the Tua that everybody thinks he is. He, the guy's already injured all the time. He plays through them, and that's tough. That's good on him. But at the end of the day, what does it benefit you to play through injuries? For a team that supposedly doesn't pay you, you know what I mean, and uh, it's tough. But I, I think that I think Tua is probably the th- the third best quarterback in this draft, and and it sucks because he's gonna lose he's gonna lose a lot of money if that's the case. Well, I think a lot. Before we get into this, I'm gonna say good night to the kid. Yeah, don't Can I have a kiss? Okay. You, wanna, you, wanna say, you are the kid. You wanna say goodbye? <laughs> Bye. Say, say good night. Good night. Good night, buddy. See you soon. You want to give him a kiss? Oh, he's not going to read Good Night Moon. You're going to read it. <laughs> night Moon, it sounds like a really good porno. <laughs> I'm blue hey, I'm big. I'm going to step outside. Hopefully, the temp didn't drop too much. There we go. Here's, here's the thing that I think a lot of scouts and talent evaluators would have loved to see. We're playing in the SEC. What Joe Burrow has going for him is what he did and the success that he had playing in the best conference in college football. Hey, it's not what he used to be, you know. You look, there was a there, there was a long string of, of USC quarterbacks that, that went pro and had pretty yeah. decent careers. You know, Mark Sanchez, Matt Leinart, uh, Carson Palmer. Uh, and I think when they were playing, the Pac-10 was a much stronger division. Now... Not so much. I mean, the SEC is king. There's no debate about that. Uh, so anytime you have a kid uh, like Joe Burrow, who has, you know, all the tools, he, he, you know, he has the size, he has the arm strength, and on top of that, he's had success uh, in in the SEC. I mean, that's you know, you can never say, a, especially a quarterback is a surefire uh, number one pick, but the guy's legit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the thing about Cincinnati is that they've had all this time. They kind of knew they were going to get Joel Burrows at some point. Uh, now people are saying that they might draft like Isaiah Simmons or Chase Young or or something like that. First of all, Isaiah Simmons, as good as he is, uh, linebackers in this draft are you have so many of them, and not maybe not to the level of Isaiah Simmons from Clemson, but you do have you do have guys that are that can fill in a role and you can get them in the second round. You know what I mean? Second or third round. So if Cincinnati, if Cincinnati doesn't draft the best player that they need right now, if they do draft the best player they need right now, I think they should draft Chase Young, not Joel Burrows. I don't know why. I think that Chase Young is probably the best player in the draft, and it's tough for it's tough for me to justify drafting a quarterback when you're not a quarterback away from winning a championship. You can go and get a quarterback either later in the first round, which I don't know if they have another pick, or in the second round, maybe get a guy like Jordan Love from Utah State like you were talking about, or even uh, there's a kid out of... Um, um, fuck, who am I drawing a blank on now? Anyway, but there's, there's a few guys you could probably get later on that maybe aren't franchise quarterbacks that can't fill the void that you can work on. So I just don't know if Joe Burrows is the number one pick for sure. I'm more of the type of guy where I need to take the best player available, and Chase Young to me is the best player available. Chase Young is a great football player. I mean, he's a once in a lifetime talent. Uh, and I think that, you know, and this is subject to the evaluation that they've made and, and their scouts' observation and, and the time that they put in studying a guy like, like Chase Young. But I would, I would assume, without having numbers in front of me, that the success rate of drafting, you know, positional players like defensive line players it, it, high in the first round. Uh, is a lot better than drafting quarterbacks. Of course, you know, yeah. quarterbacks are a crapshoot. It's been proven time after time. You know, like, they're, look they're, at last year, Dwayne Haskins. You know, I mean, everybody thought he was going to be he was the best quarterback in the draft, and he's probably going to be replaced this year. And he was drafted in the first yeah. round. Yeah. So you know, as a franchise, the Bengals need to make a decision. You know, do do they think that they have someone in their building? that can do what they ask them to do because every team is built differently. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, you have teams that are going to build around their quarterback that are going to depend on their quarterback, uh, you know, to, to carry him the whole way and generate their offense uh, and, and be the backbone of their team and, you know, and be the dictator of their success. 
you have other teams that are going to build on strong defenses that are going to get a quarterback that they're going to ask to do the routine things well. They're not going to ask him to go out there and hang, you know, 40 points on a team every single week and throw for 300 yards. Uh, you know, they're just going to ask him to not turn the football over. That's it, yeah. You know, to, to hand it off, to put them uh, in advantageous situations, have a smart guy who, you know, who can walk up to the line, break the huddle, walk up to the line of scrimmage, identify what he's seeing and put them in the best situation to be successful without all the fireworks uh, and everything that surrounds that. It, it, it depends what your vision and your philosophy and your culture of your football team is. Who is um... – well, sorry, which, what job is the hardest in sports? Any sport, if you had to say. You know, I, I, I've only obviously been around professional football. And I, by, you know, by most objective criteria, I would consider myself a, a relatively intelligent person. <laughs> But the amount of information that a professional quarterback has to be able to digest from week to week, the amount of time that's required to prepare, and this isn't a knock on other sports. I know there are other professional sports and other positions that are extremely difficult to play. But, you, you know, you look at basketball, you look at baseball, you look at hockey, you're seeing these guys play multiple games a week. Yeah, football. You know, set aside the the physical aspect of it, just the mental and off the field preparation that's required. You know, to to prepare in order to be successful to play in a football game, just for any position in pro football. Period. But when you look at a quarterback and, and, and the amount of work that's required to be put in, you know. I, I don't see anything else like that out there. It's tough. I agree with you 100%. So all people always say uh, quarterback for the Cowboys, pitcher for, or shortstop for the Yankees, goalie for the for the Habs. You know, people always say those are the three hardest and most pressure-filled positions you can find in sports. It's tough not to say quarterback for that reason is that they only play 16 games a year in the NFL. You have to prepare 16 times a year. Forget about what you learned two days ago pretty much, right? Forget about all that. We're starting fresh. You need to be mentally strong. That's why the two best quarterbacks, well, two of the best quarterbacks are Manning and Brady. These guys, probably good athletes on their own, right? I mean, Brady got drafted by the Expos, whatever. But nothing against them. I would put an athlete like you against them on a basketball court. You know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. even some guys that we know that are good athletes, I'd probably tell them that they can probably beat Tom Brady in a basketball game. You know, Maybe, he th maybe he's a better... Uh, baseball player obviously because he played his entire life but if you take them both out of the sport that they never played i'll probably take you against manning on a basketball court maybe not on the golf course you never know but it it's just to say is that they're not the best athletes they're just the best quarterbacks you know what i mean and th obviously they're professional athletes so we can we put them in that category and they're not non-athletic they can still move but for the most part they're not guys that can slam dunk or run a post route better than anybody or cover another receiver or do any of that stuff for the mm -hmm. that's why it takes it takes a mentally strong guy to be that player no oh, absolutely you know if you're talking best athlete in any sport or toughest position to play strictly from an athletic standpoint no yeah. absolutely quarterback is definitely not i mean we've seen guys uh you know, we've seen overweight guys, guys who are out of shape, guys who have very limited athletic uh, abilities have success at the quarterback position. But if, you, if you're looking at, at the grand scheme, you know, the whole picture, everything that goes in to not only playing that position, but having success at that position at the professional level, I don't think anything comes close to it. You know, yeah. it's, I, I don't see how Drew Brees could, could play a game on Sunday afternoon and, against one team and come back uh, on Monday night and play against another team and, and be successful. It's because there's so many yeah. small segments in football, right? Where basketball, it's like, yeah, they have plays and hockey too. They have plays designed up and I get it. But in baseball too, baseball is the same thing. Make sure you're in position, do, get the guy out or get on base like pretty much that's those are the two things you have to do in baseball how you do it is a different is a different it was a different way to think about it but when it comes to football it's that you there's so many small segments in a game that you have to be so well prepared in basketball lebron james everybody talks about how his he has like a photographic memory and um he remembers every play from pretty much every game that he's played 
And it was crazy. One time they were, he, he says that he watches basketball four games at a time and he can tell you exactly what's going on in all four games at any point of the game. And uh, like he's that smart, which is great. And he's probably the best athlete we've ever seen realistically. And uh, but it's just it's not as it's not as hard as playing football or being a receiver, let's say, or being a tight end. You ha- there's so many small segments, like I was saying, of this play we're gonna run a run play to the left because this is whatever, or we're gonna we're gonna run this dig, or you're gonna do whatever the fuck, like so you're gonna change something. And the fact that they're able to change things on the spot and know exactly what eleven other guys on the other side of the field that they didn't talk to all week, the fact that they know what they're doing is pretty crazy. That's why, what like like Cam Newton, people are but people hated on Cam Newton for a long time, and we just uh, Pease just wrote a nice article about how he's still good. Like Cam Newton is fucking Cam Newton. He's an MVP. He won a national championship all within the last six years. So let's give the guy a break. The guy has, he came in his first, his rookie year. He was great. Sophomore year was a slump. Most sophomore years for quarterbacks is pretty, it's always for rookie quarterbacks. It's always a little tough. Then he comes back and he wins the MVP the third year. Now people are saying that because he hasn't played well in two seasons that he's done. The guy still has it. He's six foot five. He's probably got a cock like this. He knows what the fuck he's. <laughs> you know what I mean? He knows what he's doing. Give the guy a chance. I'm sure he'll be fine. He's a, like the prototypical athlete, and he's gotten so much better. At early on in his career, he wasn't great at practicing or he wasn't great at preparing. Now that's all he was doing, and he really fixed that. and And he became a good quarterback. He just needs maybe one or two more years. And it's tough that he's not on a team yet. But I think that he should find a team pretty soon. Well, that, that might be the wake-up call that he needed. And it, it, it's not, you know, I don't think you can squarely blame him for the way the relationship played yeah. out in Carolina. Um, but Cam Newton is very likely a guy who relied strictly on physical talent for a lot of his life. Yeah, Like you said, he had success early on at the NFL level, probably felt like I can get away with this. Then sophomore slump, teams start adjusting. I mean, this is professional football. Everyone else is getting paid too, yeah. you know. And that's where he probably realized that hey, this you know this pro football starting quarterback gig probably entails a lot more uh, than he expected. I mean, yeah. physical tools, no doubt about it. He has them. I think he just needs the right situation. I need mean, he needs to find a team that appreciates him and a team that can build around him. And you look at those teams and you go back to when we were talking about the draft. There are guys like Cam Newton who are still out there. And so is there necessarily pressure for Cincinnati, uh, you know, to go out and take a quarterback in this draft? Is there necessarily pressure for, for the Miami Dolphins to go out? Who knows? You know, why, they may why wouldn't be... Miami take a chance on Cam Newton? Maybe draft a guy later on in the first round since you have three picks there. And if Cam Newton doesn't pan out in a two-year contract that you give him, then you have a young guy who's been developing, and you throw him in. And if he's good enough, he's good enough. You know. So I don't see. I, that's why I don't say that right now. Joe Burrow's is the for sure number one pick. Like I'm looking at. I'm looking. I'm looking at right now at the NFL Network, and one of the writers has Chase Young going first overall. So. <clears throat> just to say is that that's a possibility and then they sign Cam Newton a guy like Cam Newton or they trade for a guy like well Mariota just went to the Raiders so I don't know about him but maybe trade for Derek Carr you know trade for a guy who's had success that just needs a new system new eyes you know and we need a fresh start you know? yeah exactly he needs Alex new Smith people in his ear these new people around him it's funny you're talking about Alex Smith obviously every time the draft rolls around they talk about Smith going number one and Aaron Rodgers, you know, sitting yeah. in the green room and falling all the way down to the Packers. I think it was at 24 or 25th. And I, saw, I saw a picture of Aaron Rodgers on draft day with oh his, my God, uh, I remember that. You know, his, his boy band, friggin' <laughs> his frosted tips. Flattened down. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> but that's another thing is Alex Smith, he's a guy who just, he's always looked for a new opportunity. He's always gotten that opportunity, but he, he's had like 11 offensive coordinators in his career. Either, regardless of how good you are as a quarterback, Tom Brady hasn't had 11 offensive coordinators. Manning had the same offensive coordinator up until he left Denver, you know? So it, you need some sort of uh, continuity and, and somebody that's going to be there for you and de- and help you develop. If you don't have a good coach, then you're fucked. You're absolutely fucked. You know what? what's tough and then what really works against these young quarterbacks is if you look at the way the draft is built, the teams picking at the top are actually – technically the worst teams in the league at that time yeah you know and, and if you know anything about pro sports especially pro football 
you know, it's, it's a, what have you done for me lately business? You know, a lot of these, a lot of these coaches on these struggling football teams, whether they be head coaches or coordinators, because we know these staffs, they travel in packs, they get recycled. A guy gets hired somewhere, you know, it's inevitable, uh, inevitable, whether it's, you know, the first year he's there or within the first two or three years that he's there, he's going to bring in his guys, the guys that he's comfortable working with. So eventually it's the same staffs that are just moving, you know, from, from team to team. But the reality is when these guys are getting picked, when these quarterbacks are getting picked in the first round, you know, they're not going to the New England Patriots where they have the luxury of sitting behind Tom Brady for a couple of years. They don't have the luxury of having Bill Belichick who's been there for years, the same offensive coordinator. Now, obviously, a lot of Patriots and coordinators have come and gone, but it's not been a revolving door where they're gone, you know, every year or two. It's guys who stay there, who buy in the Patriot way, uh, who develop as coaches and eventually, you know, pursue opportunities somewhere else to become a head coach. Yeah. But that's not the case when you're looking at, you know, at the top, you know, 10 teams picking in the draft. And so these young quarterbacks are getting thrown into the lines there. It's true. We we just uh, got joined by uh, Duke. Do you see him? So, boys. Ooh, What's wait up, a boys? There, there he is. What's cooking, baby? Look There's at those Cap light. Rope. Look at those light structures back there. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. You know, some, the, the only sometimes, thing nice about my life is them is them lights, man. <laughs> you can't you can't hide the money sometimes, man. <laughs> <laughs> Did That's I miss something? I feel I feel like I joined this draft way too late. Yeah, you what, joined what? it twenty five minutes in, buddy. I hate this format. <laughs> this whole digital format. It's, it's 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 like more commercials than I expected. And give Derek Carr any kind of competition. This is the best idea. For real? Yeah, he needs competition, man. He, the, the, who's who? Who did he ever compete against? Matt Schaub, Peterman. Fuck knows who else. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck who else. Yeah, you know, you've got a lot of your 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 Twitter draft specialists, and you know you've got a million analysts on on, on NFL Network who are professionals at what they do. I'm, I'm not knocking what they do. They put in a lot of work. They put in a lot of effort into evaluating these guys. I mean, some of these guys on on TV on whether it be ESPN or, or NFL Networks or whatever, put nearly as much time at, you know, as, as NFL scouts and stuff evaluating talent getting ready for the draft. But the reality of it is when you have a, a human element in it, you, know, you can base yourself on all the film you want, on all the numbers, the measurables that you want. The draft is a crapshoot. Yeah, always. The draft is it a really crapshoot. really is. And, and history proves that right every single time, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it, it, it's tough, you know. There and it'll be an interesting format with with all the GMs doing it from home. <laughs> but I, I will say that I've never been so happy to watch the draft, though. <laughs> like watch something, you know. I will. Yes. Uh, I'll give you guys five five players, five okay. players, and yeah. you tell me who is the biggest draft bust all about of them. Okay. Okay, so these guys have uh, already draft busts. Uh, these are these are historical draft busts. Okay. Obviously, we're gonna go. Obviously, there's Ryan Leaf, Jamarcus Russell. Uh, there's Brian Bosworth and Charles Rogers. Who would you say are Charles Rogers was the was Charles Rogers was, was the corner? No? Out of, he was huge. He was the Charles no, Rogers he was the receiver at the line out of Michigan State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't remember. Out of Michigan I can't State, remember. Yeah. It sounds familiar, but I, I don't know enough. But it has to to me. It has to be Jamarcus Russell. Jamarcus Russell is very bad. So I, I, bad. Well, for you, you feel Jamarcus Russell for sure. But to me, Ryan Leaf was at a time when it, it was it was common to have a first round bust. You know what I mean? Where Brian Bosworth too was the same thing. Like people got drafted back then, that nobody even watched play. Like he was at Oklahoma, but he was just a juice head, freak cokehead. You know what I mean? So I mean, it's I think that's that's it's it's not. A shocking bust for me. The shocking to me was Jamarcus Russell because Marco, that was at the time when you and I were watching college football every fucking night, and he was like the man. You know, and there was nobody better than Jamarcus Russell that year. Yeah, I mean he he had all the intangibles. Well, he had a rocket arm. Yeah. Uh, I think he I think he measured in. He was about six six or six seven. Yeah, it was a monster. Uh, you know, it's. You, we just didn't know that he had zero work ethic, and he was <laughs> zero, <laughs> zero zero work just, ethic. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but also, oh, but, sorry, go ahead. What, what do you expect? 
Oh, yo, did you, did, yo, Terry, did, did you ever hear the story of uh, right, Mar- when... Marco's got a bounce? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. I'm not leaving. She was getting on me oh. for yelling. I was getting <laughs> there's uh, Marco <laughs> Russell. <laughs> yo, McKenna would yell. There's a story that kept it circulates on on Facebook all the time. Like this is like the most famous Jamarcus Russell story. It was like that when he he was a couple of years in, if you I think it was his second year with the Raiders and they wanted to test to see if he was really like studying film. So they gave him a blank cassette. They gave him a blank tape because it's the Raiders. So it's for sure a cassette. It's for sure a VHS. And like they gave it to him, and the next day he's like, "Yeah, he's like, oh yeah, I, I watched it. It was a blank cassette." You know, <laughs> they, as, this guy. I and mean, I had so many stories about. I remember the first time I had seen him in a press conference with the Raiders. He had like a giant Rolex. He had like all of the best like gear ever. And his first and it, it, his first few games were actually pretty nice. But nah, after a while in the NFL, they just they just figured you out. You know. But I mean, the guy at the end of his pro day threw a ball off of one knee, seventy yards through the goalpost. That's all that all Davis wanted, man. That's all he wants. You know, and and, and they got hooked. And I, you know, what I would like to hear is the recordings of the telephone calls of these NFL personnel men calling LSU staff and <laughs> asking about Jamarcus <laughs> Russell and his work ethic. Like, what what was being said? I mean, someone's full of shit over at LSU, you know? Someone is legit full yeah. of shit. Like, what, but, uh, and honestly, it's it's got to the point back then where it was, it was more of, um, it was more of like, um, we have to take this guy because he is consensus the best guy, you know? Well, it's also the Al Davis effect. Because Al Davis doesn't listen to anyone. He never listened. God bless his soul. He never, never listened to anybody, and when he would often get, uh, uh, when he would often get reports from other teams, he wouldn't trust it. We're, we're very similar, me and Al Davis. We don't really trust anybody, yeah. and we tend to make terrible decisions. Yeah, exactly. um, <laughs> another, no, another notable bust, actually. I don't know if you guys remember this guy, Justin Blackman from the Jaguars. Well, Justin Blackman was he wasn't a first round pick. He was a he was an Olympian. Oh, okay, okay. No, no, I I, no, no. I'm thinking a lot no. of. I'm thinking about I'm no, thinking about uh, Gatlin. He's just overall. Justin no, Blackman overall. was at OK State. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was thinking about somebody so, else. So, so Justin Blackman he drafted fifth overall, 2012, and I remember that I remember hearing a story a story much 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 later because he just put out a leak that a lot of teams were very uh, they were very like kind of standoffish about drafting him because they had you know these teams have secret investor investigators like. Marco, you might know better than me about this because you got experience. And I don't. I just I just fucking read Twitter all day. But the they they had like these investigators that would track him and stuff, and he would legit spend his whole day in bar. Like he'd just get <laughs> drunk all day, and then and some of the investigators would tell teams like, yeah, you got to be careful with this guy. Like he doesn't have the right habits before getting into the league. You know, and I can only imagine like you're in college, you have all of these like tendencies to party and like have fun. And then you get to the NFL. It's like, no, you, you got to actually like study all the time. You have like, I don't know. Do, do you need, like, do you need those kind of work at that work ethic before getting to the league? I've always wondered that. Oh, I think you absolutely need it because it, you know, it's a rude awakening, but here is once again, one of the, the traps that's built into the draft and that's built into professional football in general Guys are trying to save their jobs every single year from the top down, from the GM to the head coach, all the way down to the special teams, you know, assistant and the quality control guy. Yeah. And, and so you're drafting fifth overall. You know, you need some offensive fireworks. You need to take a gamble. You look at a guy like Justin Blackman who checks every single other box as far as measurable, measurables are concerned. I mean, he's been productive in college. You know, he's no. got the size. He's got the speed. He's got the hands. So what? The guy has a drinking problem. Okay, well, you know, maybe we have, maybe we have the, you know, the resources to try and curtail this, uh, you know, and contain this if possible. Uh, but at one point, you know, and, and Terry and I were talking about it. If you're picking in the top five of the draft, it's because chances are you're coming off a pretty miserable season, you know, unless you pulled off a, uh, you know, a conditional round pick that, that paid off and. And now, yeah. you're, you know, you're picking in the top five or, or the top ten. Uh, sometimes, you know, some teams are willing to go out on a limb and take that risk. And more times than not, it comes back and blows from yeah. right back in your face. Yeah, yeah. What was, it, what, was your, what was your biggest rude awakening when you, when you like, started playing, I guess, professionally for professional team, not college? Like, what was, like, the big change in your, in, in your whole life or work ethic or whatever? 
and, and this is not to say anything about the culture of the locker room that I went into because when I got to the Alouettes in 2010, it was a locker room full of veteran guys who had had success, who were led by Mark Tressman, who was one of the most intelligent, most brilliant uh, football minds I've ever been around, you know, who, who ran a tight ship, who was a no-nonsense type of coach. But the dynamic changes in professional sports, especially in football where there's so much turnover from week to week, guys coming on and off the practice roster, guys coming in for workouts every week, it's a job and you're competing every single day. And if you think that you had stress, you know, worrying about picking up your playbook or, or you know, or learning your plays or stuff like that, think about every day being a job yeah. interview. Cause you know, you're one yeah, yeah. bad play away from being out of there as opposed to, you know, university or college football where every day or, or CJ football every day, you're going to hang out with your boys. Like Terry can attest to this, you know, when we we're at that game, yeah. what were we doing? We we're hanging out at Jake's with our boys all night. We go grab yeah. a bite to eat. We go back, you know, carry hot dog, you know, practice, you know, you weren't, you, know, you weren't worried about losing your job or anything like that. But, Pro sport well, you weren't business. worrying about losing your job. I lost my job. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I always, I always wonder this, right? So, okay, so there's a guy ahead of you, veteran, drafted before, bit of a contract, whatever. You ever just tell yourself, like, yeah, I'll just slash his tires tonight, just so that he's late tomorrow. You know, I can tell you, you, you that. I can tell you this that for Marco, <laughs> I can, Marco, up until he he went to the CFL, he I don't think he ever had to deal with competition, like when it comes to like somebody being better than him. That's like coming in at the same position. Like he always had Liam, which was right behind him. And Marco will say that Liam was better than him. And I mean, it's I think it's it's up in the air with that one. But Liam also was a sick receiver. So you were able to like he was able to learn through you and play one year as a receiver or even just back up through you kind of thing. So you never really had the guy where most guys like when it comes to linebackers or DBs, let's say especially in the CFL, there's so much competition. And you went into being a linebacker DB into the CFL and you made a career out of it. You made nine years out of it. Yeah. And uh, you know, a lot of that was intelligence and, and hard work and, and worth that work ethic. I mean, I, you know, I'll say it 10 times over, not only, you know, you use Liam as an example, but I, I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of guys in the, in the CFL that were much more talented than me. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. But, you know, they either bounced around teams because they couldn't pick up a playbook or they had attitude issues or it, it's no nonsense. And the CFL is much different than the NFL as well because the guaranteed money's not there. You know, a, a team is not tied into a guy, you know, for, for four years, uh, 24 million guaranteed. You know, all you have in the CFL is what you've got uh, as a signing bonus when you signed your contract. Mm -hmm. So they're not afraid, you know, after two years, even if you're a first round pick, uh, they'll move on from you. They don't give a shit. They don't have, you know, it's half next, of their salary cap tied up in you. Yeah, it, it's, it's next, next one up guy. all the time. All the time. Uh, and, and it used to be even crazy before they changed the, the rules in the CBA. You know, you talk about Chris Jones a couple of years ago in Saskatchewan who had a whole, essentially a whole other football team uh, that would practice after the riders were, were done practice. When I was with the Alouettes, Jim Pop, you know, on almost a daily basis would, would bring, you know, anywhere from five to, to 15 guys just for workouts. And so, you know, you'd be wrapping up practice and you'd look over and you'd see a dude, you know, decked out in USC gear, warming up for his workout, you know, and, and the next thing you know, you're like, holy shit, I know that guy. That guy yeah. was all Pac-10, you know, yeah, for, yeah. For, for two <laughs> years. Like, fuck. And then you start doing the math. Well, okay, well, he's American. And, you know, we play a Canadian at this position. And, oh, well, you know, if they wanted to change the ratio, they could do this. It's, it, it was a lot of mental gymnastics. And, <laughs> and uh, it required a lot of mental toughness, too, right? You know, how all am right. I supposed to finish up my, my last reps of the day when I know that my report? You know, the guy that they're hoping is going to replace me is on the sideline warming up, you know, for his workout. That's going to about to start in 20 minutes. Well, it kept you on your toes, right? It kept you honest as a player. So that's yeah, why you, you put drugs. That's why you buy drugs. Not yeah. you. Someone else buys it for you. Then you put it in their bag 
and then you call the cops on them. So, see, Duke, I think you're I think you're offering your services here, man. I think a lot of CFLers they're gonna call you up and be like, "Listen, there's a kid from USC that's coming in. He's way too good, and I need I need him to to get drug busted." You need, everybody needs a little what sketch. Everyone what a sketch a, a side sketch guy. What so, I really would have appreciated is somebody at the border, you know, somebody at the airport who could kind of <laughs> weed, weed them out for me. Like, hey, hey, look for the guy with the Nike duffel bag who's coming. Don't let him in. But was there anybody, Marco, <laughs> was there anybody, Marco, that actually, because uh, you started um, probably your sec, as of your second or third year, right, as you came in? When, you came uh, third, third year, I started getting some starts. And then by my fourth year, I was essentially a, was a there, full-time starter. Was there anybody that came in and you're like, okay, this guy's actually going to take my job? Kind of thing, and who was it? If it was, is that fucking guy Liam? Is it? Liam had a couple of in the CFL. Liam played like three years in the CFL for like three different teams. Yeah, Liam bounced around a little bit, and uh, you know, I I think that Liam's issue was. And I mean, it wasn't, it was out of his control. It was just finding the right situation. Yeah. You know, I, I was fortunate. I ended up in, the, in a great situation. And I went through some years where, you know, there was new coaching staff and, and new management, but I was able to to stick around. And I was fortunate to, to have a seven year run in Montreal before having to move, uh, move out west. But as far as, you know, guys coming in, taking my job, uh, yeah, you, you, you get that. Nervous. It, it happened uh, when the Alex drafted um, drafted Mike Edom. They, they took him in the first round, coming out of Calgary, uh, and I ended up starting that season, kind of being a, a, a rotational player. And Kai uh, Kai Hebeir got hurt, so I filled in for a couple games at will linebacker and started and, and played so well that when Kai got healthy, you know they had no choice but to to find somewhere in the uh, in the lineup for me and that's when I moved uh, I moved over to free safety and kind of bump you know Mike out of the way and, and Mike went on to have a great career I mean he's been an all-star yeah. several times over uh, and, and he's you know he's somebody I consider a, a very good friend but you know he, even there you know when, when, when they draft a, a Canadian in the first round at your position obviously you worry a little bit and and sometimes, uh, you know, you end up uh, you end up getting the, the short end of that stick. Uh, but but things work out. You know, if you're a good person and you work hard and you're a good player and you do what they ask of you and, and you don't make any, you know too many mistakes, uh, things usually work out in your favor. Yeah, got another idea. Got another idea. You 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 pack a lunch. You pack an extra lunch. Pack an extra sandwich that day. Like, but you, you know you you hang out. You get, I don't know what athletes do. I'm yeah. not an athlete, but like. You know, you hang out. I don't know fucking cafeteria table. I don't know what what they're at. So you, you you give the dude a sandwich. He doesn't know bath bath salts inside the sandwich. Starts acting crazy. Like coach, we can't we can't deal with this guy. Can't deal with this guy. I like it. Listen, I've I've seen a, a player that I won't name, uh, <laughs> who who later on was was diagnosed. I, you know, I, I don't want to slander him. I, I would, I think it was bipolar. It may have been schizophrenic, borderline, yeah. something along those lines. Anyways, the guy threatened to kill Mark Tressman in the middle of our locker room while everyone else was in meetings. And Mark Tressman retreated to his office, locked himself in the office, and had to call security at the Olympic Stadium to come have this gentleman escorted out of the building. That's fucked up. That yeah, fucked up. But uh, yeah, and like, and like, let, let's be serious. The Olympic Stadium, like, their security is not like top notch. It's a couple of like old Jeanettes, couple of a couple of guys with hot dog <laughs> bellies. We, we've <laughs> seen the security. A we, couple old Jeanettes. I like that. Old yeah, Jeanettes. yeah. We like when you when you go there to go go to an event. Like, it's all the all they always have the oldest, crustiest people as security guards. Like, yeah, of course. Not this guy. Of course. Well, listen, security guard at Olympic Stadium might be the best. Job in the biz, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, what you, you you have a handful of events every year. The rest Monster, of the, the time Monster Truck Rally, where sixty six percent are kids. You, at least the rest of the time, you're driving around the Olympic Stadium in your golf cart, minding your own business, not yes, much going nice. on. Fuck, I you know, know, nobody's going to get a new job. It's, listen, what, what, what are you doing nowadays, nowadays anyway? What are you doing nowadays anyway? By the way, your couch looks like an addition couch. Just putting what's, that out there. An, I think oh, I've seen it. 
I think I think I seen it in a few videos too. Are, are you and talking, why don't you have? Are you talking? You about, have no art behind you. I just ordered. I showed. I showed you what I ordered. I ordered like a bunch of stuff here. It's gonna be like six images. I have Steven Gerrard. I have I yeah, have, six images of, of Barry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that guy! Yeah, that guy's made the internet unbelievable. Barry, yeah. Barry is the highlight of 2020 but, already. But Marco, how long have we been sharing Barry? Though we've been sharing Barry for at least a couple of years now, right? Barry's been around for a while, and and I and I I hate you know, I hate to crush your dreams, yeah. but I've I've heard that Barry is a Photoshop job. No, no man, no man. Uh, he's I, heard, got a big... I, thought, I thought you were gonna tell me that he died because he did die, and apparently no, no, no. He's he he's dead, yeah. and apparently he was uh, he, oh, he, he was, it was gay porn. <laughs> yeah. He was. Gay he didn't die because he didn't die because of gay porn. No, 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 no. I'm saying I'm, he was doing gay porn, and that's where the picture okay. comes from. And, yeah, and the photographer. But who hasn't? Who hasn't? Though? Exactly. Yeah, the photographer is asking for money, so he can pay Barry's family. So because apparently he died, like he got really sick or something. And if it's a Photoshop job, that's a shame, man, because that thing is glorious. But here's the question: Have, Has anybody seen a video of Barry in action? I don't know. I, I'm, I, on I, I'm on I, it. I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm on it. It's gonna take you like, Barry's in action. I'm sure it would have been sent to us by now, eh, Marco? I mean, it must have surfaced by now. You know, I've seen you know much less relevant videos surface. You know, in a much shorter amount of time. How do we get to Very that? Porn. Very porn. Oh, Very Duke, big Duke, you asked me. Yeah, the, it looks like the casting couch. So I have. I'm getting six pictures here. One of Steven Gerrard, a Montreal Expos logo, um, uh, a jujitsu thing. I got a. I got a Kill Bill uh, Hattori Hanzo photo. Hattori Hanzo. I got uh, what else did I get? I got uh, uh, lyrics to uh, uh, Beastie Boy songs. I got you, you literally have no fucking style, just no fucking style. It just you just got random shit. You got random shit. You I got things. About- I got things that I like. I got things that I like. Did you did you, did you measure things? No, it's all the same size. It's all the same size. I got it from the site. That's the worst. That's the worst. It never should never be the same size. It should be irregular sizes so that they can. Okay. Kinda- hey, hey, listen. I'm not working now. So I'm not gonna go spend. <laughs> I ha- I have other ideas for other sizes, and it's gonna be listen, feng shui. It's gonna be nice. Listen, the government's paying everyone, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just got my two K. <laughs> but uh, and I'm that's, waiting. That's, I've, I've been waiting for years for a blow sign. it on a bunch of random things. I've been waiting years for like a a, a fucking twenty by twenty signed dick pic of Marco, but he hasn't sent me one. Yet. But but look look at that master's class in interior design and lighting back this there. Is- this is not bad. This is not bad, man. This is is not that your, bad. Is that your kitchen, Duke? Like this. This is this is. Hold on, I'll, I'll face it right away. Oh, I know where it is. Yeah, I know your house. That's the, yeah. you're looking. You know, yeah. at, we're in the kitchen, basically. Is uh, see that? Yeah, beauty, beauty. I love it. And I got this shit over here. My wife is taking over the kitchen, so I'm getting more claustrophobic than ever. But uh, don't don't show your wife because then she's gonna get DMs from guys that are much better looking than you. <laughs> she probably doesn't. Do, do you know what I think the, those light fixtures are? They're an what is ode that? to the man. Yeah. They're two hanging testicles with the one <laughs> testy hanger lowering than the and other. Massive. It's actually, that's true. That is true. There's always one. There's always one that just a bit heavier than the other. It's the worst. I ordered some. Go. I ordered some pizza. Not. It's coming in like 20 minutes. Pizza. Yeah. I, I fucking love pizza. I know, man. It's fucking, I can't get away from it, man. I just can't. I was. I even pulled out a veal steak tonight. I was gonna cook that, and then I sat down and I was like, "Fuck it, man. I'm just gonna order some pizza." Do you know? Do you know? Do you know what I've really been indulging lately? Into lately, especially during these quarantines, seeing as the Dollarama is one of the, you know, the, the last standing great stores out there right now. <laughs> Which is they sell they sell dark chocolate covered almonds that are dairy free 100% vegan for a dollar a dollar 25 the bag yeah you and they are, they are that sounds amazing yeah there's actually nobody in the world and duke i'm telling you this nobody in the world okay. that likes sweets more than marco this guy <laughs> this guy <laughs> this guy I, I, I had to hit the turbo button for some extra sweetness <laughs> I don't think the camera caught it because what, what's happening now with the camera is that it's it's only going to the people that are talking. No, here's what you gotta do: you gotta slide it to the side and zoom, and then you can get full panel. You can get everyone. No, so I have in our program here. I'm able to put all the the cameras, but every time I put one of the cameras, it um, 
it, it, it just keeps on replacing with whoever's talking. So I've been trying to fix it the entire time. The first 15 minutes of the show was fine. It was me and Marco on screen. We're good to go to Garni. To Garni. Un petit peu d'ananas sur le top, big. Ouais, c'est ça, big. <laughs> so, yeah, Hold we're, we're stuck in there. But uh, I wanted to ask Marco something. I forgot what it was now. Yeah, so you, you, are, you are, like, the worst when it comes to sweets. I've never uh, seen anything or, like it. Or, or the best, depends or the best. how you look at it. Or the, or the best. Dude, when, when Ben and Jerry's started making vegan ice cream, listen, I had to cut a hole in all my pants because I got freaking. I'm <laughs> Comedians now, it's like you don't. But even... I'm cooking. I'm cooking bacon at the same time right now. Oh, if you don't see me, I'm cooking bacon. Sick. You yeah. know, at first, at first I thought maybe you were burning some incense or some essential <laughs> oils or something. Yeah, because you see, you see the vapor. You see the vapor going. <laughs> so yeah, P's just messaged us and he wants to come on, but I think uh, I think we've uh, I think we hit an hour. We hit over an hour here, so we'll probably cut it short. Yeah, boy, here, here, here's what I got to tell you. I got to tell you guys what I got on the menu tonight. Okay. Yeah, tell us, man. I'm, I'm going to start from least favorite and then work my way to the tip. I like it. Least favorite, num- coming in at number three, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Oh, pff, bonus. Mm. <laughs> number, t- number two, we're going to Vanderpump fucking rules, boys. Fanny what is Pump, that? Lisa Vanderpump. <laughs> what? You are not well versed in ETV <laughs> reality that. trash TV. And and the best that I'm going to save for last because I want some sweet dreams when I go to bed tonight. Summer House. Oh, yeah. I heard about and Summer so... House. I heard about Summer <laughs> House. What's good? I heard Summer House gets your fucking piss hot. I heard it fucking. Oh my god. And this is it. You, you got you guys ever hear the the Hi You app H A Y U? I don't think so. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just haven't installed it. But what is it exactly? It's like um, it, it's a lot of reality TV shows, real trash TV, mm-hmm. just all you know in in one place. And you get the the fresh from the U.S. episodes the day after. So when you know Real Housewives Real Housewives plays on Wednesday night. On Thursday morning, it's on the app, ready to fucking go, oh, baby. <laughs> I gotta get it, man. The way you just oh, explain things. It's, no, it's, it's it's like six dollars a month. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. I love it. I fucking love it. All right, boys. I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh well. So uh, do the draft, huh? Yeah. Marco. This is it. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Appreciate it, man. Take care, my pleasure. Anytime. It's been great. It always is. And 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 you know, I, I feel like. I've been on enough at this point, and I think this really puts me over the fence. I would now like to be referred to as friend of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you've, sure. all, you, you know, you've always been a friend Absolutely. of the show. I feel, I feel like I, th- I, I got worried. I thought you were going to say it's time for you to have a podcast because fucking everyone else has a podcast. <laughs> well, we'll do it together. I think, I think Marco and I had spoke about it. I'm even going to put it and change it now. Uh, we, had, we had spoken about it to do one. Maybe we can do Literally, it on the hot sauce. Everyone has a podcast on it. Yeah, but Marco doesn't. Listen, That's if true. We can get, if we can get a, a freezer large enough so that I can murder my family and store their bodies in the freezer <laughs> so I can have enough free time to, to do a, a regularly scheduled podcast, that'd be fantastic. I'm in. Easy. We need to come right. up with a name, though. We need to come up with a clever name. Hey, we'll come back to you on that one. Something to do with brew. Some brew. Uh, the fresh brew, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, the brew crew. Yeah. Oh, the, brew, the brew crew. It's been the it's been okay. the brew crew for years, so why not? Uh, the, the brew crew has been around. I yeah. just call it Shikli Opatra. Hey, all right, Marco. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Appreciate it. And, yeah, uh, take care, man. Have fun tonight watching your three fucking uh, reality show love stories, whatever they are. And uh, Duke will probably be on. You and I, you, you, me, and your brother on will be on in a bit to do uh, the draft. Yeah. Are, are you ready? Or are you cooking fucking bacon? Uh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Salut, boys. <laughs> <laughs>